Follow with me, if you will, in Matthew 13. Start at verse 53, something that Jesus is going to say that has uh, quite deep significance to us. That it might, uh, it probably would be something that most of us could pass right on over and not really understand how it applies to us. But he says in verse 53, it came to pass when Jesus had finished these parables, he departed from there. When he had come to his own country, he taught them in their synagogue so that they were astonished. And they said, where did this man get this wisdom and these mighty works? Is this not the carpenter's son? Is not his mother called Mary and his brothers James, Joseph, Simon, and Judas? And his sisters, are they not all with us? Where then did this man get all these things? So they were offended at him. Now realize he's in his hometown here. But Jesus said to them, A prophet is not without honor, except in his own country and his own house. And he did not do many mighty works there because of their unbelief. Now this same thing will be repeated several times. Let me read a few. Mark chapter 6, verse 4. Jesus said to them, A prophet is not without honor except in his own country, among his own relatives, and even in his own house. Now he could do no mighty work there, except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and healed them. And he marveled because of their unbelief. Then he went about the villages in a circuit teaching. Luke chapter 4, verse 24. He said, Assuredly, I say to you, no prophet is accepted in his own country. John chapter 1, verse 11. He came to his own, that would be Jesus, his own did not receive him. John chapter 4, verse 44. A prophet has no honor in his own country. Now, why is Jesus saying this and saying it so often? Well, firstly, because it's true. Now, the question then we would need to pose is why is it true? Why is it true that Jesus is saying, and a prophet is a generic sense, anyone sent by God would fit into the criterion he's speaking of here? Anyone that's sent from God oftentimes will not be received or honored by their own, by their own relatives, possibly their own household, uh, certainly in their own community. Well, why is that? Well, it's very simple. Now, there can be tributaries to this, but it's very simple. It's pride. Well, what's the origin of pride? We know this, and I'll just read one place of several in Scripture you go to about where pride came from, but Isaiah 14, verse 12 speaks of, uh, uh, the man's name is Lucifer, and it actually is debatable. It probably really was a human being that was some kind of a king at one time. But most commentators today, and I believe it to be true, believe that this is a prophecy of, of the old days with the devil himself. And they call Lucifer here. He's the son of the morning. How you are cut down to the ground, you who weaken the nations. Lucifer said, I will ascend into heaven. That's him talking. Now, of course, you hear the pride just gushing through. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will also sit on the mount of the congregation on the farthest sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. Notice the I will, I will, I will, I will, I will pride. Yet, God speaks, you shall be brought down to Sheol, to the lowest depths of the pit. This is in Isaiah. There's a place that somewhat parallel to this in Ezekiel. I won't read today, but it speaks of the, the sun of the morning as well, and it talks about an angelic host that was created, in essence, to be next to God in, in proximity. He was a, a minstrel of sorts. And this is, this is him. This is the one we know as the devil today. And what he did is pride entered his heart. I don't think for a second God the Almighty that created this one didn't know this was going to happen. He certainly did. And when pride entered his heart, then he was trying to take God on. The one that created him, he was trying to take him on. And he was defeated. Revelation chapter 12 talks about him being cast from the heavens in the sense that he can't stay in that place with God any longer. 
And his assignment, as best he understands it, the devil, is to do warfare against those that believe in, in God and, and Jesus in this case. Proverbs 16, 18 said that pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. What I am drawing a point here today is that why was it that Jesus, when he would go to his home, his family, his hometown, why did they not receive him? And he said that's not just of, true of him. This is consistent throughout the ages. It has been a problem. And it's always because of pride. Familiarity. I know that person. I saw them grow up. I know his sisters and brothers. I know his mother and dad. I know where he lived. How could he be saying the marvelous things and the awesome things he's saying today? How could he be doing these miracles? How could that be possible? Well, it's pride. 1 John 2.16 all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, it's not of the Father, it's of the world. And so what we're talking about here, again, I'm going to draw a parallel shortly in how that applies in our world today oftentimes. The Bible says that no flesh will glory in God's presence. This is a very powerful section of Scripture that Paul wrote to the Corinthian letter, the first letter that he wrote to them that we have record of. And in this setting, his concern is, he wrote two letters to the Corinthian church that we have in Scripture. Some believe he wrote more than that, but we have two of them. And in both cases, he's describing to them that they have become very fleshly, very self-righteous, very immature. They're fussing and fighting. There's sin going on that nobody's dealing with. Uh, they don't know how to relate together when they come together to have communion. Some of them come drunk. Some come hungry. They're disrespecting Christ and His body, which is a word I have spoken in the past to others. The disrespect comes from the incre incredible sacrifice that God made. This song we just heard, He's crazy about us. It was because of love that He died for us. And He sacrificed everything to save us, and then what Paul is writing this letter back to tell them is you guys are disrespecting him for what he has done. Verse 18 of chapter 1, 1 Corinthians, For the message of the cross, it is foolishness to those who are perishing, and that would be true. But to us who are being saved, it's the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Paul says, where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this age? Well, they're on the news. They're in Facebook. They're in social media. They're everywhere you look. The wise people, the experts, they call them. I get so weary with hearing that term because I always say, well, who determined that they're an expert? Maybe they are, and maybe they're not. The wise, the scribe, the disputer of this age. Has not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? And, you know, we probably need to have that on a placard or on a big uh, wall sign for everybody to read. God has made foolish the wisdom of this world. For since in the wisdom of God, the world through wisdom did not know God, it pleased God through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. Now Jews, they request a sign they want, they want someone to prove themselves a sign. And that still doesn't do it. Jesus gave them all the signs that any human being and more could ever have been brought, and they still didn't want to believe in Him. Greeks, they seek after wisdom. At least they think they do. Problem is, they don't know wisdom when it smacks them in the face. But we preach Christ crucified. To the Jews, that's a stumbling block. To the Greeks, foolishness. Both cases, that's pride. The Jews, it was a stumbling block of Christ's message of the cross. That's pride. To the Greeks, it was foolishness. Well, that's pride. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, it's Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. He's talking about the cross. Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men and the weakness of God is stronger than men. For you see your calling, brethren, but not many wise according to the flesh, now, we see this all around us. Not many mighty, not many noble are called. Meaning, 
most often this kind of arrogance and pride is so pervasive that they are unwilling to receive the message of Christ and his cross. But God has chosen the foolish things of this world to put to shame the wise. God has chosen the weak things of the world to put to shame the things which are mighty. And the base things of the world and the things which are despised, God has chosen the things which are not to bring to nothing the things that are, that no flesh should glory in his presence. I need to stop there for a minute. I, I read an article just briefly, and I didn't retain much of it, but the other day, of some wise person, and for those that are on the tape, I'm doing air quotes, wise person, was saying the ridiculous things that the church wants to hang on to that they should have let go a long time ago. Some of those things have to do with the, I always say it wrong and my wife helps me correct, LGBTQ plus community. This person writing this article said, how stupid are, is the church that they haven't seen that this is okay, this is good. How stupid is the church that they still want to say that you shouldn't have sex outside of marriage, these kinds of things. How stupid is the church that they would believe that God became a man, that God died on a cross. How stupid is the church to actually believe this? That's the wisdom of the world at its most arrogant high point, which is actually the most great low point. And Paul said all of that in a day when Paul wrote this, he had been educated by, some believe Gamaliel was the most educated human being on the face of the earth at that time. Paul had actually been trained personally by him. Paul was a rising star in the Jewish world. If given enough time, he was going to be right up at the top of the Sanhedrin. No question about that. He had their ear, they loved him, he was doing exactly what they wanted him to do. That was to persecute the church, to arrest Christians and have them put to death. Paul was so filled with pride he had no idea, and yet he thought he was doing God a favor. This is going on today in the world and in the church at times. There are people in the church at times that are doing this same thing. They're persecuting what God doesn't want to be persecuted. They're fighting a fight, but fighting it wrong. Have you ever heard that before? And it's all about pride. It's all about self-righteousness. And Paul boils it down to this one verse, and I think I told you this a few weeks ago. There was an evening. I have these kind of times a lot with the Lord when I've got a song going through my head all night long, or a word or, or something. I told my wife I woke up this morning, I told her I had a dream last night that I was standing to lead worship somewhere, and I couldn't read the screen and the song that we were singing is one of the most difficult songs, and it's a real song, a hymn that we have sung before in other settings that has all these different words and I don't have it fully memorized. You know, Amazing Grace, I've got that pretty much memorized. That one I didn't. I knew the song, I knew the tune, and I realized I can't read the screen, so I was just making up the words. <laughs> now some of you in the room know that I do that still to this day. I don't mean to, but I do sometimes. And I had this, this word going through my mind all night that night, and it said that no flesh will glory in his presence. No flesh will glory in his presence. Kelly was kind of echoing some of that just a few minutes ago. No flesh will glory in his presence. And what is he talking about? Mostly, the one that should get stung by that word would be those that are religious people. And even more so, those that believe in God our Father and believe in Jesus Christ. Because even then, people in that kind of world can still have their own flesh in the mix, oftentimes probably not realizing that's the case. Until I pick up my cross daily, as Jesus said, and follow Him, and let the Word of God and the Spirit of God keep transforming me, there can be the old flesh in the mix, and I don't even know it's there. You can do it with the best of intentions. Paul thought he was doing God a favor by crucifying God's children. But he wasn't. But he thought he was. The wisdom of the world, the wisdom of the flesh. 
And it can be just as much pervading in the religious world and even in the church sometimes as it is in the world world. The people that certainly don't honor God rightly. He said, no flesh will glory in his presence. Verse 30, but of him you are in Christ Jesus who became for us wisdom from God, righteousness, sanctification, redemption. Give the list of everything that God is. That's what he became for us. And that's who he is in you right now. Verse 31, that as it is written, let him who glories, let him glory in the Lord. Meaning, let's stop the showing off. I love sports. I watch them. Uh, some of the most show-offy stuff you'll ever see is in the sports world after they score a touchdown. They don't even have to score a touchdown. They just have to make a first down or even pretend that they did. And they get up and they act like they're the king of the world, you know. And that annoys me. The thing is, the truth is, they were supposed to do that. They're paid, what, millions? They're supposed to do that, you know? And, and I get it that people like to see the show. That's why they continue to do it. That's why they let them go back to showing off in the end zone, which they didn't let them do. What was it, about a year they made them quit that, Sherry? No, they let them do it. Why? Because people like the arrogance. They like the show off. Uh, why do we go to a show with, I um, can't ever think of her name, that Kelsey's girlfriend now. What's her name? Uh, Taylor Swift. Why do we go to a show like that? It's not for the music. Don't, don't lie to me. It's not, not saying that she can't sing, but it's not for the music. It's for the show. The, the concert environment, the, the massive amount of people and the noise. Why, does, why do people rather be in the stadium than watch it on TV when it's a football game or a basketball game? It's the ambiance. It's that presence, right? Now, I'm not saying that's all wrong, but the scripture is very clear. There's only one place that I'll ever have glory, and that's in Christ. Christ in you, the hope of glory. And why do we want the glory? Well, that's the value. That's the worth. We need it. Certainly, we were created by God in his image to have glory, to have value, to have worth. But you will not, I will not have that as I allow my human flesh to get in the way. The glory that I will have is the glory of Christ. I can't be more exalted than when I'm exalting Jesus. That's when I am exalted. That's when I'm experiencing the glory. That's when it's all good. And I'll tell you a little secret. When I'm doing that right, I have no pride and no flesh in the mix. That's when I'm doing it right. Now, humility, it's the pathway to exaltation. I've been saying this for a long time. Jesus said in Matthew 23, verse 12, whoever exalts himself, he will be humble. And he who humbles himself, he will be exalted. This is a fact. That is a spiritual law that will always be true. If I try to exalt my flesh, even if I don't understand that's what I'm doing, I'm going to get humbled in the way I don't want to. Uh, you can use the word embarrassed. We can be brought down. Uh, Years ago, Wilson Phillips' brother, uh, Dale, had a very prosperous business in California, uh, the tire and vehicle business. He sold tires primarily and had several locations in, in the Los Angeles area and very prosperous. Dale was a good guy. I knew Dale. And Dale was here one time and he was talking about this and he said, you know, I recognize that, that God can do this, but he said he did do it. He said, one day it just seemed like God turned the spigot off. Nothing had changed in his business. Nothing had changed in his community, but it was like all of a sudden, uh, where he was making money, he wasn't. And he come to recognize that God did that to get his attention, to humble him in a, in a good way. And, and, and he was right. God does do that. And why would he do that? Because he loves us because God is still the source of all things. Some people like Bill Gates and, and many that I could mention, they need to recognize this. What they have is, uh, is because of a grant and a loan from God himself. And yet, oftentimes we somehow think it was us. Now, were we involved? Of course we were. Did we do hard work? Did we labor many hours? Possibly so. But listen, there's no exaltation unless it comes from God. 
But the Bible says very clearly, if I humble myself, he will exalt me because he wants to do that. James chapter 4, verse 6. God gives more grace. That just means gifting. Therefore, he says, God resists the proud and he gives grace to the humble. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil. He will flee from you. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord and he will lift you up. His desire is to lift you up. 1 Peter 5, 6. Humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time. It is God's intention from day one when he created humanity to exalt his children. He created us in his image. And then sin came. And well, did that ever mess things up? And so God began to give a conscience through the Old Testament law and the prophets of how he wants us to think. Draw near to him. To love him with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. Did you know that was in the Old Testament law? That's repeated in the New Covenant. But it's all, always been there. And then, and then we come to Jesus who fixed the problem. So let's read what Paul says about that in Philippians 2 verse 5. He said, let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus. He said, this is your attitude. You need to think, I need to think like this. Who being in the form of God did not consider it to be robbery, to be equal with God. Well, he was God. But he made himself of no reputation, the word kenosis. Uh, he emptied himself. Taking the form of a bondservant, coming in the likeness of men, being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself. This is our Lord, our, our pattern. This is our pattern. He humbled himself, and then he became obedient to the point of death, meaning he gave it all, even the death of the cross. And therefore God also has highly exalted him. See the, see the pathway? Humility or humbling myself so that God can exalt and he's given him a name which is above every name. That the name of Jesus, every knee should bow. Those in heaven, those under earth, those under the earth, those on the earth and those under the earth. That every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God our Father. Now we're talking about something that Jesus said. He said he went back to his hometown, even to his own family, and they didn't receive him. They didn't honor him. Well, it's very simple. It's pride. They knew it. Why is it that at times I can hear somebody else say it that I don't know that came from another place and it, it grabs me? And I might hear somebody right next to me say it and I don't even hear them. Partly that's because of familiarity we get into. Sometimes it's because we may have seen their own shortcomings along the way. Now, Jesus had none. Jesus was a human being a child that grew up to be an adult. He didn't ever sin. But even then, you know how it is, people can get offended at us even when we don't do anything wrong. But I can look at my wife and say, well, I've seen some imperfections along the way. They're not that many, but a few. She can do the same with me. And we can use that as an excuse to not hear when God is speaking. But we need to humble ourselves to hear from the one that God sends. Matthew chapter 10, verse 40, Jesus says it this way. He who receives you, receives me. He who receives me, receives him who sent me. This receiving is what we're talking about. When he went back to his homeland, they didn't receive him. They didn't receive honor there. They didn't receive the calling of God upon his life. And he who receives a prophet, in the name of a prophet, he shall receive a prophet's reward. He who receives a, rich, a righteous man in the name of a righteous man, he will receive a righteous man's reward. Now here's the ne negative side to this. Matthew 23, verse 34. Jesus said, Therefore, indeed, I send you prophets. He's talking to the Jewish religious people, by the way. I send you prophets, wise men, scribes. Some of them you will kill and crucify. Some of them you will scourge in your synagogues and you will persecute from city to city. Now this is rep repeated numerous times in the Gospels. It wasn't just Jesus that wasn't being heard. It, it was a a there was a tendency for all that God would send. Well, why is that? Well, pride. 
self-righteousness, uh, the devil working through people to blind them at times to what's really going on. In Acts chapter 7, verse 51, these are the Jewish people that are, that are causing such great havoc to Peter and Paul and John. He says, you stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears. Those are pretty strong words. He's talking to religious people, the Jewish religious people. He said, you always resist the Holy Spirit. As your fathers did, so do you. Which of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? And they killed those who foretold the coming of the just one of whom you now have become the betrayers and the murderers. He's speaking to those that were there when Jesus was killed. Now that's the negative side. That does not have to be true of us, but oftentimes through, through history and scripturally said it has been. But God does choose to speak to us through his people. John chapter 8 verse 47. He who is of God hears God's words, Jesus said. Therefore, you do not hear because you're not of God. Well, that's kind of the simple way of putting it. We, uh, we either hear the truth when it comes or we do not. The problem is oftentimes through the vessel that it comes. You know, a lot of people say, well, I want God just to talk to me direct. Well, he does. He does do that. But he also does another thing that is a little more of a problem oftentimes in the church, and that's also he talks through his people. 1 John 4, 6, John says it this way. He said, we are of God. He who knows God hears us. He who is not of God does not hear us. By this we know the spirit of truth, the spirit of error. Now you'd say, well, John was an apostle. Okay, I'll give him that. Well, it's, it's a bigger deal than that. Because Jesus said, anyone that I send, if they re are received, they'll receive that reward. Anyone that I send. 1 Corinthians 12, verse 7. The manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one for the profit of all. Now, Paul is talking about in the church now. Us. Us. The manifest manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one for the profit of all. For to one is given the word of wisdom through the Spirit. To another, the word of knowledge through the same Spirit. To another, faith by the same Spirit. To another, gifts of healing by the same Spirit. To another, the working of miracles. To another, prophecy. To another, discerning of spirits. To another, different kinds of tongues or the interpretation of tongues. What is he saying? He's saying when you come together with brothers and sisters, whether it's in the church setting or just out there where we live, there will be times the Holy Spirit is going to give Sarah something to share with Sherry. This is God's doing. Why would he do it like that? Some would say, well, I just want him to tell me. Well, he does do that kind of thing. But pride and arrogance can keep us from getting a good thing. Did you know that? Did you know my self-righteous pride and arrogance can disqualify me from all kinds of good? It certainly will, according to Scripture. God will have to humble me. And the problem is, we may say, well, I don't want to hear it from that person. I like them, I don't like them, don't know them, whatever. But what if God has chosen that he's going to speak to us through that person? Paul goes on to say, verse 11, But one and the same Spirit works all these things, distributing to each one. Notice that each one. He's talking about all of us now, not just pastors and leaders. Each one individually as he wills. 1 Corinthians 14, 26. Paul said, well, how is it then, brethren? Whenever you come together, well, what's he talking about? The church. When we come together, each of you, notice that, each of you, has a psalm, has a teaching, has a tongue, has a revelation, has an interpretation. Let all things be done for edification. What is Paul saying? He's saying God has this uncanny way of humbling us. Because the truth is, many times, if not most of the time, Christian people would prefer to not hear it from someone else. They'd prefer to hear it direct from God, and sometimes we don't even do that. Because Paul said, we resist the Holy Spirit. We do this all the time. I was talking to Craig about some things the other day when we were together, and this kept crossing my mind as it relates to the Scripture or to the, the message today. When I was uh, at the other church setting, 
uh, I oftentimes answered the phone. I wasn't the only one, but I did a lot of the time. And we would get phone calls, and I've told this story before, but I want to tell it again. Uh, people still used the yellow pages back in those days, and a lot of times people had come to new, new from other places, but that wasn't the only time. There were times that people would call that lived in Springfield and had been here for quite a while. And what they'd call and ask is, do you do counseling? Well, yes, yes we do. Can I come and make an appointment for counseling? Well, we always did, of course. I don't know how many times in my life personally this happened. And then others were going to have some of the same business of the pastors, but I had this a lot. So we'd come and we'd start to get acquainted and you, I start asking questions and they start talking and almost, almost every time this happened, that person is going to a church somewhere in the city. Almost every time. And I'm talking about a Christian, Bible-believing church. Oftentimes I even knew the pastor or knew some of the people that were there. Almost every time that they called us to know if we do counseling, they were coming to us for help. And so I would ultimately, I'd always come around on the same question. I'd say, well, have you talked to your pastor or some of the folks there about this? No, I'm, I, don't want to, I don't want them to know about this. I don't, want them, I don't want to tell them some of these things about me. Well, what's that? Well, it's pride. I understand it. Do we not all understand that in this room? It's pride. What's the problem here? Well, it's that God has ordained a better flow than that. I'm not saying that everything that ever happens in your life that's good will come within the confines of your local church. I'm not saying that. But I'm telling you there is a reason why we come together. Paul said there's a reason for it. And the scripture very clearly says God puts people in the church as he chooses, meaning where he wants them to be. So what I'm thinking when I'm talking to this person, though I'm going to do my best to help them, I'm going to share with them the truth as I understand it. I'm going to do my best to help them. What I'm thinking is, how far beneath the privilege that God has given you, you're living right now because you don't understand. Because oftentimes and probably in every case, this person's need probably has been given opportunity to be met in that church, but they're unwilling to hear it, unwilling to receive it because of their, their pride. They're embarrassed. You know what I'm saying? And it may not even be because they've done any great sins or anything like that. They just don't want someone getting that close to them that they know. You understand what I'm saying? Jesus went back to his hometown. He's been gone for a while and the reputation has preceded him back to his hometown. He's been doing miracles, raising the dead, healing the sick, setting free the captives. He's been doing all of this and he's declaring a message that no one has ever spoken like him before. And he gets home, and you know what should happen? A celebration, a rally of the, uh, like they do after someone's won the Super Bowl or won the World Series, you know, a celebration. Coming, Jesus, we know you, Jesus. What an honor. But that's not at all what happened. When he got back home, not only were the people of his community not willing to receive him, but his own family. Not until after the resurrection of Jesus did his own family even receive him. They tried to do an intervention at least once because they thought he was out of his mind. Now, yeah, I understand. I grew up with little Jesus growing up to be big Jesus. I understand that. He's a real man. He's a person. He went to the bathroom. He did things that we all do, right? He had to eat, he had to sleep, all that stuff. How can this be that this one could be the one? But Jesus said it's not just with him. This happens oftentimes wherever you go. I have seen this in my life and I have probably failed who knows how many times that we don't recognize what's right in front of us. What's right next to us. Because we're looking somewhere else. I'm, I'm, I'm looking over here to see the answer. I'm wanting it to be over here. And what if God put the answer right here? What if it's through someone we know? 
someone we care about. Not saying that you dislike them, although it can be that too. Say, I don't like that person. I don't, they can't talk to me. But what if God makes them to come and talk to you? What if that's the case? Well, that's going to be a test, isn't it? And the reason that this really struck me for weeks now, I've been looking at this message and thinking about it, thinking how troubled I am at times for God's children. I'm not saying they're not going to go to heaven. I have a message for you next week if God allows me to bring it that I said a few weeks ago that I brought to you a message that's the most important message I've ever, ever spoken. Well, this will be number two. Okay, What I'm sharing today is a big deal if we hear it. Big deal if I hear it. Uh, I have heard stories about people in business, just out in the world, that someone was coming to them to offer opportunity to them and they didn't receive it because they didn't, didn't think that person had anything worth offering, let's say, or didn't like them, or that they were so set on something else or some other person. I, I, it's got to be this person to speak rather than this one and, and have missed it, missed opportunities, not just in the flesh world. Let's talk about in the spiritual eternal world. Let's talk about that one where God has a great desire to exalt his children. Listen, it's his idea. I don't have to twist his arm for him to want to exalt me, his son. But there is a path that takes me there, and that's a path of humility. Well, we have to let God even define when that's happening, because I've heard people that are Christian people say that they're humble, and I'm stepping back and looking at it, and I'm not so sure. I mean, seriously, I'm not so sure. Now, they're saying they are, but maybe they don't see. They probably don't. Deception, pride. The Bible's very clear that pride can deceive us. It does do that. Well, how do I keep that from happening? Well, I do what Jesus said. I'll take up my cross every day and I'll follow him. Well, how do I do that? Well, I meditate in the word and I am intimate with the person of the Holy Spirit, but there's more than that. I'm also intimate here with his people. And I have to say, God, I can't tell you who to send my way. That's your business. I just pray you give me the grace to see it, to recognize when they've come, when they're speaking, when they have something to offer. I love this story. I'll tell it. It doesn't sound so deep spiritual, but it, to me it was. My lovely wife has always worn contacts in the years I've known her, and she had a terrible problem in the earlier days of, of losing them. Not so much in these latter years. But when we were dating, just all the time, she was losing contact in the most awful times, the most awful places. And well, the problem is contacts are expensive. She wore hard contacts and they're expensive. So there was always a great need to find those contacts when they, she would touch her eye for some reason and boing, and they'd pop out. And they could end up in places you can't believe. One night I'm taking, uh, I'm getting off my story, but let me tell it. Uh, I'd gone to, we weren't married yet, Christy and I, and I'd gone to Neosho to pick her up and we were going to go down to Blue Eye and, and meet my grandparents for the first time. Mom and Dad are down there and Kelly, I'm sure, was there and probably Johnny. And so I'm going through and cutting through and going through Cassville and so forth. And about two-thirds of the way through, we got into one of the worst uh, rainstorms I've ever been in my life, driving. I mean, it was, it was hairy. And it was dark, and I'm driving my Vega, and I'm driving along, and I'm telling you what, those old roads that do this, they're curvy and up and down, are not oftentimes painted well with middle uh, paint and, and outside paint. I was having a terrible time staying on the road because there wasn't one place that it was staying in a straight line, and the rain was so hard I could barely see the front end of the car. And my wife lost the contact. <laughs> and so she's reaching all around to find it, reaching, I'm over here driving, she's reaching underneath my foot pedal, underneath the brake, she's everywhere, down the seats, she's trying to find that. I'm trying to keep us from dying, literally dying. And I'm not kidding. Probably as far as driving goes, it was the most 
fearful may be anxious at least I've ever been. It was that bad. And I'm at, having this extra help and it's not working out. We finally made it to Blue Eye. It's dark, it's still raining. They have all gone into the storm cellar because my grandma is just deathly afraid of, of storms. And they did have a couple of tornadoes that hit, tore down their barns and things. Sound familiar, Gloria? But anyway, we get there and the storm cellar is outside of the house and about 30 or 40 feet over and they built that down in there. And we pull in and one of them yells and says, you need to come with us, they're down in the cellar. So we get out of the car, she can't see because she's only got the one. So she jumps on my back and I carry her through, through water, probably, probably a foot deep, I'm not kidding, to the storm cellar we go down and that's where we first met. So we haven't found, we haven't found the contact yet. So we come out the next morning and, and you know how it is, it's a bright sunny day, beautiful day. We get to looking and she did a lot of things and then what she did is she lifted up the floor mat on my side, the driver's side, and it was underneath the floor mat. Now some would say, how did that happen? Well, it did. Another story about the Holy Spirit using people was with Sherry and Liz here a few years ago in the house we're living in. Currently, Christy lost the contact again and we looked and looked and looked and looked and looked and looked and looked. And Sherry and Liz have this uncanny thing, spiritual gift of finding stuff. So did you call them, Christy, or how did that happen that they came I over? I mentioned that I was going to have to order a new one. Okay, so they came over, uh, anointed by the Lord, came over. You only been there about, what, five minutes? <laughs> and Sherry found it. Now, here's my, here's my question. If we had said, well, Sherry, don't need to come, then probably we'd been buying a new contact, right? Because I'm not sure we were going to find it. That's a very simplistic story of something that can be a bigger deal than that. I have watched this. It wasn't just the people that would call me on the phone that didn't go to our church that wanted to know if we had counsel. It was sometimes people within our church that they also wouldn't reach out, not just to pastors, although that's a place to start. God may want you just to reach out to a brother or a sister. But pride, I don't, I don't want to do that. I don't want to let them know that I'm not perfect or I'm not strong or whatever it is that we're dealing with. And believe me, I'm a human being. I came out of the womb like all of you. I understand why people do this kind of thing. But what is this? It's going back to what Jesus was talking about. He said, we have, and he didn't use the word pride, but this pride gets in our way so often. Now what I'm talking about today can fit to every one of us in this room, probably has who knows how many times, and probably there will be option, opportunity for it to happen again. And that is that I need to say, God, I want to hear from you. I've heard people say, don't ask God for what you're not willing to receive. Because if you say, God, I want you to talk to me, and he sends it in a way you're not wanting, then we can miss it. Have I missed it through the years? I'm confident I have. Then I come back to the mercy and the goodness of God, and I believe that God loves me. So I believe He wants to show me. There have been times in my life when people have come to me and told me things, and I didn't receive it at first. I can tell you that since I've been a Christian. And then at some point later on, the Lord said, that was me. That was me talking. So what Jesus said there wasn't just about Him. In fact, He didn't say it was. He said, a prophet tends to not almost ever have honor in his hometown with his own people. That should not be. If God gives me the grace to bring the message next week that I have every intention to bring, I'm going to share with you some things that I really think are so right, so powerful, so good, and it's so present. So present. I had a person call me a few years ago and and they said uh, I've got this problem and they told me what it was they weren't I had been with them as a pastor for years I was not currently their pastor and uh, they're telling me the problem on the phone and I'm listening and I'm hearing and I said well I cannot tell you what to do here and this person got angry with me or frustrated and they said well I know this pastor over here if I go to him he'll tell me what to do 
And I want to say, well, why didn't you do that? <laughs> I didn't say that, but I'm thinking, why did you call me if you don't want to hear what I got to say? Now, it's not just about me hear this, folks, but I had that happen so many times through the years. I'd have someone come and talk to me, and, and I'd give my best wisdom, whatever that was. And I'd found out later that they'd gone to two or three other pastors and leaders because they weren't really thrilled with what I told them. Seriously, that kind of thing happened. Well, again, I'm a human being. I understand how this is. You go to one they talk about in parenting. Uh, husband and wife need to have a unified, unified front with children because they'll try to work one parent against the other. It happens all the time, right? Well, a good parent, good parents, will recognize the tendency for a child to do that. Some are better at it than others, but, the, but to not let that be. Well, why? Because it's teaching me a deeper thing. It's teaching me how to humble myself. One of the things I concern for in children that are growing up is that they never get opportunity to learn how to submit to authority. Sometimes parents get in the way. Sometimes schools get in the way. Sometimes government gets in the way. They're not learning how to submit to authority. I like better the stories of these multi-billionaires now that they don't just give it all to their kids. They make them learn. They make them work. They make them start off down low and work their way up. That's the good way to go. You know, humble yourself. Let God exalt you when the time is right. So Jesus said, you know, you know it had to be hurting Jesus' heart that his family was rejecting him. Now he's fully aware of the fact that one day they're going to come back around. He knows that, just as I do with some people that I pray for right now. He knows that's going to happen with some. But nonetheless, when it happens, don't you think it hurts a little bit? It stings just a little bit? In fact, the people that can hurt you the deepest are the people you love the most the people you're the closest to. Doesn't mean they always will, but it certainly means they can. Craig, you want to come and help me, please? Father, I thank you that you've given me everything I'll ever need, and you will continue to do that. You'll do it sometimes in ways that are just very clear and obvious to me. And other times you'll meet my need in ways I never saw coming. In many cases, it will be through another person that I never even considered could be a person that could help me. But it's just kind of your way. You love us enough to humble us so that you can exalt us. You want so desperately to bless us, to meet our needs, to give us what our hearts are truly crying for, and Lord, so often we're chasing in a wrong direction, the wrong way, but you still love us. And I thank you, Lord, today that you have brought me and brought us this far. Your promise is that you'll go before us and make the way. You'll be our rear guard. You'll never leave us. You'll never forsake us. But Lord God, you want to bless. You want to exalt your kids. Lord, give us grace to humble our hearts. Give us grace that where we may not be doing that, that you'll show us. Because we want to do that. We want to humble ourselves. We want to bless you. We want to exalt you. And Lord, I know this, that when Jesus is exalted through my life, that's when I'm truly exalted. Thank you, Lord. For surely the presence of our Lord is in this place. I can feel His mighty power and His grace. And I can hear the brush of angels' wings. I see glory on each face. Surely the presence of our Lord is in this place. 
Surely the presence of our Lord, He's in this place. I can feel His mighty power and His grace. And I can hear the brush of angels' wings. I see glory on each face. Surely the presence of my Lord, He's in this 